We feel ready to go. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you. Thank you for taking time again to join the um, CAP meeting and for all your work that you've done over the last month. As I was saying, as we were kind of gathering, um, it's been really exciting to see, um, you know, the research that we've started to gather and put together. And uh, so thank you all. It's, it's really great. Um, so our agenda for today, um, we don't have any decisions that we have to make, um, but we're going to be reviewing a lot of content. So just a reminder, we'll start with the minutes, um, then we'll have a staff update um, on APEX's work. Um, those will both be brief. Um, and then we're going to spend the majority of our time this evening talking about um, the research that each of us did. And so my request for you is to pick one of the templates that you were working on. And Maggie, you're exempted from this because I know you weren't planning to be here tonight. But for everybody else, I'm hoping that we can each take one of the topics that we were working on, no more than 10 minutes, but just at a very high level, um, provide a brief overview of the topic, highlight one potential action item, uh, any questions you have for the committee, any potential areas of potential overlap or connection with other topics. That's sort of our start. If it is straight from that, that's fine. But the goal is to just give us each a flavor for each of the topics so we can start to think about it and think about connections, think about how we might work together as a committee on these topics. And then, so we'll spend about an hour doing that. And then after that, um, we will talk about the draft report to the select board and I'd love for any feedback that you all have on that and changes we want to make next meeting we will vote on that so that we can then send it to the select board and then if we have any public comments that will be it yeah. any questions about the agenda okay um so the minutes from the last meeting does um does anyone have any comments <laughs> to the minutes I do no. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? Approve the minutes. And a second? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. The minutes are approved. Thank you. I abstain because I was. Oh, sorry, Meg. I abstain because I wasn't there last meeting. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so then we'll go on to um, the staff update on APEX's work. And Jack, can you share yes. with us how things are going? Yeah, so we're still working on the pathways, um, developing a framework. Um, and we are also actually um, looking to do a photo uh, submission. Um, different residents around town can submit uh, photos. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys would have any input on what it would be, but um, what climate change and what climate action means to them. Um, and I, cause I think we had a little bit of the budget that we could use for that. And we're going to do like prizes or something, um, gift cards, something like that. And then, um, incorporate that into our work going forward, um, as well. What is the timing for announcing that, you know, call for submissions or photos? Uh, we, this is, it's very, very early. We haven't even decided how we're going to do it. Um, so no time frame as of now. Um, but we are, I think we'll have by our next meeting, we'll have um, a logo, um, which you guys can check out. Um, hey. Yeah. And. color palette as well. Yeah, so the color palette's all set. Um, it's pretty cool. It like has, so I think you guys saw that it's, it's just gonna be um, MCAP. Is sort of the acronym, the the name of the the climate action plan, as opposed to like sustainable Milton. Um, and it's it has like different designs on it. It has like houses, and then it has like some stick figures that are like scootering, um, you know, planting in a garden, um, driving an electric car, stuff like that. Um, and there's a little graph. It's cool. It, yeah, the Apex, the design team is doing a great job. Okay. Yeah. In terms of the pathways, um, do you have a sense of timing for that? Like when they might have something ready for us to review? Um, I don't think by next meeting. Um, as of now, we're still sort of ironing out like the framework, um, what we are going to have in it, um, you know, specific to Milton. 
Um, and we've used, um, you know, a lot of the main topics um, that you guys have as well. So um, I think once we have that, we'll be able to get more um, explicit like directives on, you know, how it inter interacts with the actual GHG, you know, like, okay, like replace X amount of uh, stoves by mm -hmm. this time and we'll, we'll reduce, you know, X amount of carbon, stuff like that. I think that's sort of more the direction we'd like to go. And then um, we'll be able to share that with you guys once we have that built out a little bit. So if I'm understanding correctly, it'll sort of be co-evolving with our plan, like as we figure out more the direction of actions we want to take, then the pathways will correspond to those actions. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've also actually um, shared some of the templates um, and the outlines and the um, the work plan that you guys have. And so they're looking at that as well and incorporating it Great. into there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we can think about um, an update on, on that, having them come and join us and kind of talk about their progress at some point early in the new year. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. I think they'd be willing for that uh, to do that. Uh, not going to be the same folks, but yeah. Any other questions for Jack? Your um, your weekly meeting on Thursday, Frank. Um. Yes, Thursday. Um, yeah, and they're m more bi-weekly. Sometimes we'll meet, um, you know, two weeks in a row. Yeah, every other week. Um, sometimes we'll meet, you know, more than that. But um, yeah, Thursdays. We had a meeting today, actually. Which was good. So they're laying down a, uh, a baseline data, and we're doing a plan that relates to that or um yeah they yeah they're they're using the the data that they will be using the data um to drive their you know recommendations um and they're broken up into categories um similar to what we have with the with the um templates um and so what they're looking to produce is you know in those categories explicit um like for example you know make milton green 100 percent like the default um is like would be one of their recommendations that they would have um and then further down we'll be able to you know calculate how much that will mean um for the ghg going forward um does that make sense does that answer your question? For now. <laughs> yeah. For now, that's what you see. Yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, the, the, I think it's a little vague at this point, a little, um, yeah, not not very specific. Um, I mean, I think there's a pathways analysis in the um, uh, state roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, and a straightforward way of approach it would be to translate that to Milton, right? So there's right. chapters on uh, in industrial um, process transformation, like remove that chapter because they don't have it. Right. Uh, and but things like um, electrifying fossil fuel, heating and cooling in residential buildings, obviously applies in Milton. Mm -hmm. Update the percentages and. Um, and I think it can tell us more like what must be true to meet these goals. And then it's, I think, more on us to determine how um, to approach that given reality. Yeah. And as you think about a logo and looking at the town of Melton uh, uh, logo up there, if you will, uh, it kind of kind of captures uh, what the town was at its uh, inception. And so that if you have something like that, some and a third one of the future, that has to be able to uh, incorporate all the, uh, uh, the ideas that we like to have. Yeah. Uh, 
And so how we how we uh, see the past, the present, and the future when we kind of we and sort of our triangle of three of these. Well, it'd be cool to see the logo that they come up with, and then maybe we can talk more about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, additional graphics and tweaks and things we can add to it. Um, I just want to say, building off of your point, Alex, so I think in terms of the pathways analysis, um, I think there's this give and take between, okay, we've got the state and their pathways analysis, and that could be adapted to Milton, and I agree that's a really good starting point. And then, and then we've got whatever is gonna bubble up sort of from the ground up through this process that we're gonna have with engaging with people in the town and experts and so on. And there'll be some prioritization process, which you know kind of reflects what people in town feel like they can and should do. And then there's gonna to need to be some meeting in the middle of those things. And so I'm not totally clear yet where at Apex's pathways analysis is gonna fit into that. Like if it's gonna be responding to the priorities that we say here through stakeholder meetings, or if it's gonna be before that saying, if you did X, Y, and Z, here's how you could get to the goals. You know, so I don't, and I don't know if that's defined yet, but that's sort of a question that I have. Yeah, I, I the latter for sure. Okay. Um, and I, I, you know, I think it's going to be both of those things together. Um, okay. And that's something that Josh and I were working with them on is sort of developing, okay, what is this going to look like? Um, and definitely that ideally we'd like it to have, um, to be about, this is, you know, this is how we can achieve these, these things. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and looking at it both from um, the committee's perspective, um, you know, within the within the town, like the government and relationships with different committees, um, and you know what sort of regulations can be made um, to help those um, be achieved. Okay. I'm sure it will be helpful, and so maybe we can just get an update from them, say in January, um, that might help us kind of. I think a good thing to just have this is a simple starting point is uh, you know, think things that must happen, right? Because getting into the policies and, and strategies for making them happen is a, you know, lots of smart people are taking part about that, and nobody, nobody's done it yet. Um, but we know that you know, by 2015, if the vast majority of homes are still on fossil fuel, then we will not have succeeded. Okay. So, um, doing some translation to kind of um, uh, outcomes that are meaningful to residents, like HVAC equipment replaced. I mean, that's my mind keeps going there because that's the biggest mm -hmm. slice that we control as residents of this town. But we'll come back to this topic. I don't want to spend too long on it now, but thank you for the update. That's great. And we'll uh, revisit in the new year. So um, let's take time now and um, talk about the research that we did. And again, no more than actually, it will be less than 10 minutes. Let's try for five minutes. Because five minutes is a long time, and I want to get through you know, everyone who wants to speak. Um, and still have time for the progress report. So, um, who would like to go first? Don't I can go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, if you look in the folder, you'll see there's now two because I couldn't delete the older one. I have an updated one. You'll see in parentheses. And which topic one. is this? Is transportation. Okay. Sorry, transportation. And it is a big topic. <laughs> um, so since I did it in Google, um, I put a link to it just so, you know, that's like the original. But kind of the biggest thing I think about is, you know, what, 
what can we influence as a committee and or as a town government on transportation? Uh, you know, private vehicles, there's a lot of history of, around that. Um, and of course we have people in Milton and then we have people, a lot of people driving through Milton. I feel like we have very little control over people driving through Milton. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of my, my biggest one. Um, we probably have most control over municipal vehicles and fleets, but when I did the math, I, I think it's only 0.5% of the emissions. So like any time money we spend there, it's not gonna okay. get us there. Um, you know, I have a bunch of other questions there. Um, I looked at Newton's plan and I, I just basically kind of did a data dump from there of what their plans are. Um, if, so you would need to look at the updated one probably to see that. I also looked at Dedham's plan. Um, one thing they had that I thought was cool, um, I think it was Dedham, maybe it was Newton, but it was, um, the breakdown of like how many cars people owned and how old the cars were. And I was wondering if we had access to data like that based on the excise tax. Well, excise tax, yeah, then register use. Um, the town did license make it all this, no, what kind of thing. Yeah, it was a bit So mm -hmm. we could really, that would be good info to know. Um, Maybe some of our something we could accomplish would be, you know, newer cars might be more energy efficient, but you know, that's also expensive. Mm -hmm. Says the woman whose both cars are from 2010. So, um, <laughs> my general description here, you know, we kind of know, right? Like transportation is 53% of our greenhouse gases, of that, um, six of the 53%. 61% comes from passenger cars. I took in some of the data from the greenhouse gas inventory and made some of my own tables because I couldn't do a screenshot because it was 10 times long. Um, you know, our, our, I know our goal is to, you know, as a committee, is to reduce our community wide greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think, you know, for transportation, it's trying to find those, those ways we can influence behavior, incentivize behavior. Um, let's see, if you kind of at the bottom, I didn't quite get to put it all in here, but, you know, I put in some of our policies, like we have a traffic commission and I put in what their charges and I put in some school bus regulations. Um, I know, you know, another stakeholder like related to roads, you know, it's our stormwater. Um, there's a link for um, construction projects. And then there's all the, you know, all this information. There's so much information on, you know, especially for schools um, to, well, whether it's decarbonizing buses, um, I guess an action item I'm thinking about is how can we reduce the, the trips to carrying children around? Um, you know, I have some ideas. I think it's too soon to put like ideas out there. I am meeting with um, the superintendent in December and a few other folks in that meeting. Um, I have the Route 20 quarter study in here, the accelerating clean transportation bus, school buses and the EPA school bus, clean school bus program. So those are per perhaps some ways, I don't know if 
our town would have the budget for something like our own shuttle service? Or, you know, how much do the people in the town use the bus, the public bus system that does take the town? So those are some possible, you know, things to look at as well. There's so much here, it was really hard to pick and choose. And, you know, you could just, like, I feel like, where are my interns to help me, like, go through all this material? Um, so it is kind of buckshot of transportation at this point. I think if we can really, you know, focus in on where we could have influence, because you know, right now it's a free country. You can drive as much as you want to drive and whatever you want to drive. But... We're at about five minutes. Is there anything? Oh, that's great. No, that's a perfect high level summary. Thank you so much. Is there anything that you need to know from the committee in order to kind of keep working on this or any connections you want to make with other topics? Well, I wonder some of my questions about data. I don't know if JPEX or others, you guys can get that. That might be helpful. Um, yeah, um, I can definitely look into the excise tax, um, see what we can pull from there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the transportation data that we had was from MassDOT. Um, mm -hmm. So that might be a more of a reliable resource. Um, but I would definitely, yeah, definitely send over some questions and um, I'll, we'll look into it. <laughs> the elephant in the town is the Southeast Expressway. Yeah. Now. And um, that we don't have any control over. But um, I think you have to point that out uh, as, the, uh, as the biggest issue uh, that the town faces in terms of uh, uh, a source of. Uh, transportation problems uh, that impact uh, their like, impact climate change. And, and so those were counted, right? Even though the highway? Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's nothing we can do about it for particularly uh, except to acknowledge that it's there. Mm -hmm. And I don't uh, I just looked through quickly and I didn't see it really acknowledged. Yeah, no. And honestly in my mind I was just thinking of like driving up through the town on like town and state roads, but not the interstate. And it'd be interesting to know. I don't know if we the analysis. Yeah, the, the, the data. Down. Yeah, the data is not that um, granular. Yeah. So. Because um, I mean, if that's ninety percent of the emissions, then. That's you know, made it to What's that? About, I have made it the. Cut through traffic was about fifty percent of the emissions in the inventory and then from the highway. I couldn't do that. Yeah. What I could do was um, use vehicle miles traveled from the American Community Survey, which is by census tracts, and that's okay. The people who live there, how many vehicle miles traveled to right. the report. Uh, so that's not necessarily within those census. Right. Not you know, it's a Venn diagram. Um, but that number was between a quarter and a half of uh, the greenhouse gas inventory. Mm -hmm. So the way I think about it is that the buildings is the biggest one that we have direct influence yeah. over. Josh's uh, feedback when I made that point is, you know, anything we do to implement road diets or traffic controls in Milton will also impact the cut through traffic forms. It's not totally outside our control, uh, and yes. we focus on improving the culture of transportation in Milton, and we'll mm -hmm. probably have some follow-on uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. And if everybody else is doing their job on transportation, then yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of brings up another point, like, um, for a while I was on the uh, traffic mitigation committee mm -hmm. and we talked about sort of what the regional efforts were related to traffic and there are regional efforts and so even though we can't control the traffic on the highway I think it's a really good point mm -hmm. there's a lot of traffic on the highway through our town and that could be influenced if we were to 
um, collaborate with other communities around us and advocate for public transit, advocate for, um, you know, whatever the, the right solution might be. So even though if it's not in our direct control, it might be something that we can still have hands in. Yeah. Um, what about EVs? Do you have any idea how many EVs there are in the town? Is that something that you can get from Excise Tax? And are there any charging stations? A few, right? I mean, uh, one, right? There's, yeah, there's two here, and I think we only have two electric cars um, in, the town. in the town fleet. Yeah. Yeah. I met with um, um, Chase Berkeley a couple weeks ago, and he told me that. There's a grant application in progress for three or four more. Um, it's, it, it, I have it in my notes and there's, there's a few more around town. I've always been a little skeptical about this idea that, oh, it's, if we just put a few more mm -hmm. EV chargers and suddenly people who don't have a driveway to charge them in will go out and buy them. And I wouldn't. Um, so, yeah, I, I think. Transportation is a tough cultural issue, and you kind of have to get to the bottom of like why do people choose a car in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, I know that I would love to carpool or ride my bike more, and there's all kinds of reasons why I don't. Right. Um, and I care quite a bit about right. this. Right. <laughs> yeah. You just want to live to see that day. Right. Especially when I'm Yeah. So you can't. Uh, like you have to do a bunch of things at the same time, and only when they're all done will you start to see. Yes. So. It would be good to know though how many EVs yeah. there are to track that over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that yeah, I think, cool. yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, this is a great start. Thank you so much. A huge topic, and uh, <laughs> you've given us a good sort of flavor of what what some of the issues are. So that's great. And we'll come back to it. But in the interest of time, let's move on to the next topic. So any other volunteers? I can do it well. Um, so I looked at actually Newton as well, because mm -hmm. I thought they had a nice plan as well as Weston. And then obviously we refer to the Milton Municipality Longwood, I'm saying the Longwood preparedness plan. Obviously it's increasing more severe storms. Um, and it impacts you know quite a bit in terms of what the exceptional drought um, across the town. In terms of data, like I, I was kind of going back and forth on this. In terms of like, well, how do you mitigate? You know, when you have drought conditions, um, in terms of loss of loss of infrastructure, power, agricultural, do we have like damage information or or um, property damage information, town infrastructure like damage from drought? Wildfire, wildfires type of scenarios. Do we, we, we capture that stuff? So um, I don't believe so. Um, okay. I know, I think there was, someone was saying there was a couple of forest fires in the last yeah, year or so. I else. hadn't even heard about it, I think, until this committee. Yeah. yeah. Um, you have know, property damage. I went through a bunch of stuff. The other thing, like in terms of like other committees to like um, collaborate on, like I was thinking about conservation. We don't really have water conservation in town. Is that? I think are there some restrictions? I feel like I remember that from I think it comes through the um, you know, MWRA. Yeah. And the, was the, the, sorry, what was the question? Is there any water conservation efforts like uh, lawn, like water and lawns and all that stuff? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, in terms of like bands, I'm, yeah. Other than that, I'm not sure. I've seen it. Other towns, other towns nearby will happen, but they're on well water. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're uh, getting water from the uh, mm -hmm. thank yeah, the Quantum Reservoir, yeah. uh, and it's yeah. During the last drought, I remember where does the water come from? I looked at that, and you know, mm -hmm. watershed health was very good, so they weren't implementing any restrictions. So. Well, that should be monitored, I think. It it is, I think MWRA does monitor it. Um, and just other, like, how do we manage disruptions around transportation? Like I mentioned, public health, standing water, you know, that, that's kind of trapped in certain areas. Do we, do we measure any of that type of stuff? In terms of, like, after storms? 
Um, not Probably not that I'm aware of. No. Um, I can ask um, ask the health department. Okay. So the like in terms of just looking at how to mitigate, you know, drought. Obviously, I I don't know if we have data to like help with that or educate people on drought. Like, what does that mean? What the trends? I uh, trends from Massachusetts, but. Um, I'm not sure that was Milton specific trends, but it, it would correlate to some extent. Um, if there's any property damage, it doesn't sound like that. Acreage, and Blue Hills, we don't really have. Like, there, we live near Blue Hills, and there was definitely a couple of fires like last year, but I'm not sure we tracked that. Uh, and just probably just more educational pieces. What is drought and what is we monitor that? What kind of actions can we put in place so that folks are conserving water, you know, in their lawns, in their house, and their you know, household activities to ensure that we're obviously making a difference in a difficult change. That's great. Yeah, thank you. It seems like a, an area where I think there's a need for more collecting of data as, as being a foundational piece to then educate people. Um, but examples from other towns could be really helpful, especially down star on the well water. We could learn yeah. from them what they do for water conservation. Yeah, I'm gonna poke in a bit more. Some have created funds for low income as health assistance, but I'm not sure that we're there to do that. Like, yeah, but yeah. thank you. Mike. Any questions? We don't have a lot of agriculture in the mm -hmm. town. So in terms of like irrigation being a big source, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there are, you know, some of the institutions around town probably have, you know, sprinkler systems, but that's probably kind of small scale. Um, I'm not sure if this is would fall under drought or heat wave. I mean, those are closely tied, but um, the cyanobacteria blooms, like Houghton's Pond was bacteria closed out, for a long time. Days. Yeah. And um, Turner's was closed for a while. Like it was dangerous, like the kind of mm -hmm. thing, like if a, you know, person or dog, you know, touched the water or like got it, they would get really sick. Um, and that, you know, you think about like turn or a uh, Houghton's Pond, that's a big draw regionally. It so, is. You know, yeah. people might spend money in the town if they're here. And so they weren't coming because they couldn't go swimming this summer. Yeah, and I would say that definitely also ties into stormwater as well. Mm -hmm. um, and less so Houghton's Pond in terms of Milton. Right, like the, but, the, yeah. the fertilizers and yeah. Rock waste. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Two last questions. Do we tra we track our water consumption? Like Western references are one of the top water consumptions in the state. Yeah. Do you know where we rank? Or um, I don't, but I okay. can certainly look into that. Uh -huh. um, we yeah. definitely do track the Yeah, yeah maybe that would just be, they'll probably recognize that in the pathways to say where we are in terms of our water consumption in some sense. And the other one, like um, either Western or Newton mentioned like just a piece on sustainable landscaping. It might be something just to build in terms of an educational piece, like what does it mean, what do you do? Like right. some actions. So folks are aware of that as we get in extreme heat and more drought situations. Um, it might be just an action we just take for educational purposes. And for flooding. Yeah, I know. I've been I was like tripping on both of them being quite honest. So right. yeah, it could be a piece that's obviously collaborative on mm -hmm. Or maybe we bring them together, even we don't have to keep reaching yeah. boundaries if it right. just are so well then together. Yeah. Then. Um, it's easier to talk about than in one piece we could do that. Yeah. And that might be an area where it would be more effective to uh, develop a good work, working relationship or partnership with some of the main landscaping companies mm -hmm. in town. Because if, if they're excited about sustainable landscaping practices and uh, want to encourage residents to follow them, then yeah. they'll get a lot further than we will. Yeah. Agreed. Although I think skipping the fall cleanup may not be something they're excited about. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think so. But that's it. But thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Great. No other questions? Anybody else want to talk? He's right. Okay. Ron's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
the conservation template that I drafted and then Maggie is still reviewing it. So I'm waiting for her comments. Um, covers the Blue Hills and the Ponson River Watershed Association as the two main property areas uh, that constitute conservation land in Milton, although both of them border on and include property from other towns as well. Um, and um, uh, neither of them, there's relatively little focus on the Ponson River Watershed Association does focus on um, adaptation issues, but as far as I can tell, the Blue Hills under the management of the DRC um, doesn't do a whole lot on this particular issue. So, um, um, so then the next part of this focuses on the climate functions of conservation lands. In terms of mitigation, there's sequestration, preventing significant greenhouse gas emissions, building communities resilient to the effects of climate change, and providing habitats for wildlife. And in terms of adaptation issues, there's conservation land serve as breeding grounds for wildfires and floods, uh, help uh, wildlife weather climate change and prevent significant greenhouse gases that would occur uh, as a result of development. Um, in terms of goals for this part of our plan, I suggested that um, one goal might be to develop the capacity to monitor and respond to the climate impact of building conservation lands and um, to maximize Milton's climate mitigation and adaptation efforts in the Blue Hills and the Watershed Association. However, uh, there's really no baseline data to, to reach these goals right now. So the issues, short, medium, and long term, include this lack of data and the lack of kind of vision, design, and implementation of a regional climate conservation plan. And finally, uh, the lack of any kind of coordination on climate uh, with the DRC uh, and with other towns and communities. Uh, and um, so, in the short term, the action steps uh, suggesting uh, would be to explore interest in Blue Hills Regional Climate Advisory Group um, that would enable greater coordination with the DRC and the, the Ponson River Valley Association and other towns around issues of climate change to develop a survey that um, could gather the baseline data that we would need in order to have any kind of plan make sense and to monitor its implementation and to explore grant funding for doing, designing, and implementing that kind of survey. Uh, in the medium term, um, establish some kind of coordinating committee uh, consisting of Milton and the various towns, the DRC, the Watershed, Watershed Association, to uh, implement the survey and develop a draft climate conservation plan, and in the long term, implement the plan and improve uh, Blue Hills and Ponson climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts. There are lists list of state, stakeholders that are included that uh, we haven't had time to consult with yet, including the town of Milton, 
Conservation Commission, I think a member of this committee sits on that. The DRC, the Watershed Association, climate groups in the towns of N. Randolph, Quincy, and Dedham, U.S. Forest Service, and Mass Audubon. Wow, well done. You summed it all up. <laughs> yeah, I think you're done. I really did. That's great. Um, I'll just add to um, the Shade Tree Advisory Committee. What's that? The Shade Tree Advisory Committee in um, in Milton. Oh, I don't know. What is that? Um, essentially, um, I don't know when it was formed, um, but I've I've actually gone to their, a couple of their meetings, um, and I helped. We just submitted a, a U.S. Uh, urban Forestry Challenge grant to try and basically just buy more trees. Um, they actually do a lot of tracking. Um, they manage a, like a GIS database of you know where trees are, what kind of species, um, but primarily only like on the street level. Um, so not so much um, on the Blue Hills side of things, um, and like, you know, in people's properties. Yeah, that's and, the is, you know, yeah. on our street, Buckingham Road, about two years ago, somebody, I guess it was a town, came by and planted a lot of new trees. Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about like Milton Cemetery? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's full of trees. <laughs> um, also, like the Eustis estate, it's pretty large. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know about the cemetery. What were you thinking of in terms of? Well, I'm just thinking that it's. I mean, it's, I guess it's not under threat of being developed, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still kind of like a yeah. conservation. So true. I mean, if you're, yeah. you know, an animal, <laughs> it's, right. it's kind That's of a, a park. People yeah. do recreate yeah. in there. Yeah, there are little plots around town, some of which I think were established on conservation. I like your suggestion for the Blue Hill like regional type of approach. I don't know if that exists right now, but it would be really interesting to collaborate at that level. Yeah. And there's the Friends of the Blue Hills. There's the Friends of the Blue Hills. That's another good group. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I saw there was some group um, a couple of years ago, but they had a website. They hadn't updated it since then. In terms of um, the Blue Hills climate change, I think it was more so probably organized by like some high school students or, oh, or at least driven by it. I think Arthur had sent her, I don't know, about, I think Arthur had sent it to me. Um, I'm blanking on the name right now, but. And they're big into deer, not they're anti deer hunting, right? They're pro deer. I can't hurt one of them. They go out there and I Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, May. I just wanted to thank Ron. He did all this work. You know, I haven't been a good partner to him. Um, so I want to thank him um, for doing this. And, thank you. Uh, and next month, I, I will be all in. Um, so I apologize for dropping the ball, but um, I have been in touch with the Shade Tree Advisory Committee. In fact, one of my neighbors is on it, um, and so we're trying to work on um, some type of um, more robust um, tree plan that just doesn't um, include the street trees. Um, we've been very fortunate the past couple of years that the town has been um, given grants and donations and um and and I think though really to save the trees we have to sort of start going um um you know going into our properties and that gets a little bit tricky um we can protect our certain street trees and here in town we do have um you know if a tree is on our scenic way which is Hillside Street and Canton Ave, 
in Highland Street, then the town has control over those trees. But once you get into properties, then we don't have any control. And as we know, you know, some some pieces of properties have really big trees and really should be saved. And um, so maybe there should be some type of um, work um, to or policy that goes into when you go to build a, or pull a building permit and you want to expand or put an addition on your house and there's a tree in the way, maybe there's something that has to um, sort of just put a pause and have someone come on out and take a look at that tree and, and sort of um, determine if um, if it should be removed or not. But that's, I don't know, you know, again, that's on people's properties and that's a, a, a tough subject but that's sort of the some of the conversations i've had with my neighbor but um but thank you ron for doing all this i really appreciate it yeah let me know when you're free <laughs> um i had wildfires as part of my work and um i could barely find anything but kind of related to conservation there is the massachusetts bureau of forest fire control and we do have our um, like our fire warden for the for the county, um, and that is in it's at the very bottom of my trans transportation. I have, I have one research job right now, so um, I thought about and I couldn't find like in the you know for Blue Hills like is there a fire management plan and I, I really couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. Which I guess means it's not a huge issue, but it you know we should be prepared. It seems like emergency preparedness. Like some of the towns have just have little pieces of education on how to be prepared prepared in emergency. It might be one of those. Maybe mm -hmm. just educational and that can mm -hmm. expand. Unfortunately, things. But I think the easiest thing there is to uh, clean up the woods of mm -hmm. uh, debris and down trees, and that's. That's a very reasonable thing to do, and uh, something that could be uh, could be more easily done than uh, than so many other things that we have to deal with. Uh, so that I think it's not uh, great in terms of a uh, uh, of a preventative measure, that's mm -hmm. probably the biggest thing that can make the biggest impact. Yeah, there's yeah. controlled burns, which can be like clean it up and those are pretty good for the ecology if people just go in and remove the timber that's fallen that's not really good for the soils or the ecology so it gets complex yeah but that's that's the main problem in terms of uh, uh yeah. forest fires and wildfires that uh, that's not being cleaned out whereas in parts of the world where that that's a priority. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the problem with wildfires as, as uh, we do in this country and, uh, in North America in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that has to be uh, a, a main priority. This might be an area where we want to mm -hmm. um, consult with some other parties just to get some additional mm -hmm. perspective. So like just thinking about, again, other groups that we might want to connect with. Matt Audubon might be a good one because they run a trail site in the end of Blue Hills and they were connected there. And I think they, this is probably something to think about both the, the wildfire impact, the ecology impact, and mm -hmm. um, so maybe connecting with them would be good. And the weather station. Yeah. Oh, one of those yeah. Um, I'd say too, I don't know if you guys have met um, Branch Lane, he's the tree warden. Um, he's volunteer basis, um, but he does fill that role. Um, he's on the Shade Tree Advisory Committee as well. His name is Branch. Branch, yeah. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so. like it's the, amazing. He was born. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I can't speak. He's the tree warden? Yeah. For, for Milton. Yeah. For Milton. Um, yeah. It's like a town position. Yeah. Um, when I was in Arlington, they had a full time uh, tree warden in the DPW, or he was DPW engineering uh, office. What does the tree warden, what are their responsibilities? Um, 
from what I understood, he would communicate with other uh, tree wardens in the areas on, you know, any diseases. Um, he'd go, you know, he'd coordinate a lot um, with other towns um, on, you know, trees that are becoming um, at risk of, you know, going extinct. Um, invasive species, he would also be involved with decisions on trees in town, um, you know, if one needed to come down or if one shouldn't come down as well. Um, that's kind of the extent of what I recall that he did. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, I just want to mention one other thing um, in terms of other groups. So um, as you noted, Arthur is on the Conservation Commission. And so yeah. this evening he can't join us because he is at a meeting of the Nefunda Estuary Community Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. So that might tie into the point you were making yeah. about um, the Nepasa River watershed, yeah. and hopefully you can give us an update at our next meeting about because this was yeah. the first meeting tonight of that. Yeah. So Oof. there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 The challenge is there's so many groups working on different. Yeah, I coordinating this. So. Okay. And yeah. yeah, that's something that we discussed with Apex as well. Um, and maybe even like the idea of having a once or twice a year like meeting with all in town, um, all the different organizations, Sustainable Milton, mm -hmm. you know, and Ponset. I know they're not, they're more regional, but um, having a, a yearly or biannual meeting of the different groups in town to coordinate efforts and make things easier. Um, Should have a conference. A conference. Mm -hmm. oh, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> I mean, if we could get a bunch of these groups together with a focus, at least on the blue hills, that would be great. Okay. Well, that's great. And it, it sounds to me, too, like there, there are some overlaps and connections between drought, flooding, wildfires, conservation, like all of these things are connected to each other. Yeah. So we'll want to keep thinking about how do we structure that in our plan? Do we bring these topics together or at least cross-reference so we can think about like trade-offs and um, connections and and actions that might promote multiple goals. Um, okay. About yeah. heat waves. <clears throat> um, heat waves are defined as three straight days in the 90s or five. And I think one of the most important points is that heat wave uh, in Heat waves impact all forms of life, including plants, microorganisms, animals, and humans. Uh, I'm mostly focused on humans, but if you think about uh, the problems relative to plants, uh, you have the, the problem of uh, trees that dying and other plants dying in, in the process, so that can even affect the food supply. Uh, microorganisms can be a very uh, important area because uh, if uh, you get overgrowth or outgrowth of uh, a particular uh, kind of microorganism that we're not used to seeing that causes disease, that can uh, have a very uh, very severe impacts in the community in terms of the uh, disease processes. And uh, also, I didn't talk much about animals, uh, but uh, uh, maintaining pets and uh, maintaining uh, uh, farm animals, uh, there are relatively few, I think, in Milton, but there are some. And uh, we have to uh, probably include them in, in the plan more. In terms of uh, people, those most affected by heat are the very young, the elderly, chronically ill, and socially isolated people, and people without access to air conditioning. And uh, I think uh, regardless of uh, belonging to those groups as well as others, uh, there are lifestyle changes to think about that uh, can, that an individual needs to do in response to heat waves. And uh, the first is uh, to 
make use of air conditioning for cooling. Uh, the second thing is is acclimation uh, to the heat wave, so that, uh, that you have to change your your approach and how much time you spend outside has to be built up. Uh, also, the idea of going outside in the morning or evening and uh, not no one should really push themselves beyond their their comfort when uh, there's a heat wave. So uh, I think making that information available uh, has to be part of the plan. And uh, then also um, knowledge in terms to be, be disseminated to people in terms of responding to heat wave, uh, know the signs of heat exhaustion and heat stroke, um, know what to do if you're suffering from heat-related illness, um, know how to, uh, uh, what you can do to uh, uh, safeguard against power outages that are more likely during a heat wave because of the uh, increased use of, uh, of air conditioning. Um, so those are all things individuals uh, need to think about and do. And then uh, the uh, um, emergency community planning and preparedness in re response to heat waves. Um, and the most important thing is there really needs to uh, be identified a lead agency um, as well as participating organizations. And so uh, somebody needs to have primary responsibility to for a response to a heat wave, and that uh, doesn't always happen. So as part of our plan, I think uh, getting that getting that designation will be important. Um, the next thing is the uh, use of a consistent standardized uh, warning system that's activated and deactivated according to weather conditions so that uh, People know that uh, they need to uh, follow the uh, recommendations uh, and use of communication, public education, and public facilities. Um, and that uh, uh, involves having uh, uh, cooling centers and uh, places where, where people can, uh, uh, can go with either they don't have sufficient air conditioning or uh, uh, their air conditioning isn't working. And uh, then also, uh, how you, do you uh, target the high-risk populations? How do you structure outreach to uh, seniors and socially isolated individuals in terms of um, having those people um, be more uh, directed toward the available uh, facilities. And uh, the fact that uh, so the people with mental or chronic illnesses form the significant proportion of victims of heat waves uh, is, uh, is well known. So you have to have a uh, a mechanism for outreach to these people as well as disabled people. And uh, finally, um, uh, assuring the availability of drinking water, because uh, having water available and drinking more is, uh, is important. And uh, also uh, making sure that uh, the electricity is uh, working for the community. So these are the things that I thought about in terms of uh, uh, dealing with heat waves on individuals, um, but I think I have to also expand on the other things that I mentioned uh, as uh, as the uh, concern and uh, how to deal with them. Thank you. Also, very comprehensive. That's great. <laughs> Do we have a town communication system? Like, like if there was something like a 
emergency text like you know when you're on a campus they'll text like do yeah you leverage that for any um we do we we had a test of it the other day um within town hall and the police department um i don't know if you guys got that um i think it was just for um like the town hall but um yeah i'm not i'm not sure what that looks like um but even the cooling sound was a great idea for folks that <clears throat> just even with young children a small place if you don't have adequate cooling it's miserable as we all know or elderly folks that just need a ride to a cool place yeah i think in milton uh, um people the elderly are directed to go to the council of asia yeah. Yeah, building, uh, which is is cool um I like but, uh, beyond the elderly i don't think we really target some of these other uh vulnerable populations that um, um, I mentioned mm -hmm. yeah. so I think that uh, that needs to be part of it. Of course, I think if there's really a heat wave, anybody can go to the uh, council of aging. Uh, that's the uh, heat wave they come. That's a place to yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're probably probably buildings that have that have generators and yeah. 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 Something something like um uh. Like a door knocking process, uh, so that you can encourage and, and practice when it's not an emergency um, mm -hmm. in the name of, hey, I know we all love our privacy, but let's get to know our neighbors. And, uh, yeah, these, these, I, this is our heat wave, but it's these same people are vulnerable during floods and oh, yeah. all sorts of uh, like catastrophes. So that uh, if the uh, uh, a, a general system that it needs, it needs to be available and then uh, used in all of these uh, kinds of situations. Did you say over 95 degrees, three days in a row? Greater than 90. Greater than 90. Yeah. It would be interesting to see how many days greater than 90 we've had over the past five, 10 years. That's, that's a metric that the um, Climate report tends to give oh. projections on, and then oh. it's expected to um, increase significantly. Is that so, who, who gives that? What is that? Um, I, I don't have it uh, written down, but I've definitely seen that in uh, um, Massachusetts. Yeah, that, that's, that's for the that's easy to get. Yeah. And, and I saw the language that, you know, they, they report when they know that, you know, it's going to be a super, super peak day. Mm -hmm. So they said, I heard it on the radio or seen it in like email, like they try to educate to say, because we're going to have a, a super peak heating day that you probably won't get the cooling that because the system can't handle based on, on, the, on demand. Often the request is turn off your AC during the peak hours, like get your house nice and cool and then like let it dry at um, yeah. four to six. Yeah, uh, and then that way, the whole region is down. Yeah, and so um, I don't know if you guys are aware, we are working on a, a feasibility report for the microgrid mm -hmm. um, between Town Hall, Police Station, and um, Winter Valley as well. Mm -hmm. um, so where will it physically guys... be? Like, where will it physically be? Um, so it's, it's less of, I mean, I'm, in terms of the solar panels, they're looking just everywhere, essentially, in the area. Um, yeah. And okay. then it's, Coupled with, um, you know, like communication devices mm -hmm. um, between the the three units, um, and essentially it it works to limit uh, peak hour consumption, um, and also that they're in, inter integrating a large battery so that if the power does go out, you know, it lasts for Just four hours. Just these those three sites. Um, yeah, right now that's what we're right. looking at, and then um, I think. There's examples you guys can, I can maybe send to you guys. Um, there's examples of um, the same um, consultants did um, a microgrid in Chelsea as well as Chinatown. Um, I love that I found, I talked about the microgrid with some folks in town and people get really confused mm -hmm. because there's no actual grid. It's yes. Right. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, it's a it's solar battery installations with some light. Coordination. Yeah. And so the so idea is that right. any homeowner can do. Um, there, yeah. there are utility incentives, and um, you can't run uh, necessarily your AC off the batteries, but you can. Right. Um, 
keep keep a lot of your your home power. I mean, they're basically a, a generator. Yeah, replace a generator exactly. Uh, Can I just ask, is there, yeah. any, is there anyone on the Zoom other than Nighty? I just I'm keeping track of time, and if we might have public comments, we need to wrap up. I don't see. Don't have anybody. No. Something um, I've been thinking about with heat waves because I'm representing the school board um, mm -hmm. is that our schools are not air conditioned. Mm -hmm. And some of the reading I've done about heat waves is, you know, one of the issues is, you know, cognitive issues. So if you have, you know, a room full of students in a room that's not air conditioned, you know, one, two o'clock in the afternoon, mm -hmm it's hot, they're supposed to be learning and it's really hard for them. And so if the you know resiliency piece is air conditioning, well, that's kind of also going against our other objectives of mitigating climate. Um, well, the, the school building transition to um, uh, cold weather and heat pump, um, mm -hmm. the, the zones go air right. The primary benefit yeah. is if you don't have central AC, when you get on the heat pump, you will have it. Right. Yeah, in the things, most, most of the heat waves will occur in July and mm -hmm. August, yep. uh, more so uh, when the kids aren't in school. Sure. Uh, so that uh, uh, probably a little less impact on the schools. Although, if we have more heat waves, we may uh, start picking up May and June and September. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, problematic times. So. I mean, I walked here and it was pretty warm. So not like we need air conditioning, mm -hmm. but I know um, there were many schools that had to, to close in September because of heat waves. It was just too hot. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of a monthly month bigger okay. problem in uh, Florida and California yeah. than it is here. But, uh, um, it, it is something to think about. I think there's an equity angle here too. Um, and you were touching on this with the different populations, but also just to bring up that, you know, not everyone has air conditioning, not everyone can afford air conditioning. And so it, as that is a, to your point, is it both a contributor to climate change, but also a necessary adaptation approach? There are going to be folks in town who can't mm -hmm. do that. And so thinking about both cooling centers as a response, but also are there, you know, is there a fund that the town would want to provide to sort of support people in getting heat pump air conditioning, you know, air right. conditioning through heat pumps or other things like that that would kind of help make it possible for everybody to yeah. uh, make it through these things. And cooling centers are great, but they don't work at night. I mean, they're not usually open at night. And that's like, it's the hot nights that can really cause the biggest problem because you know by that second or third day, mm -hmm. the house didn't get a chance to cool down at night. And there's statistics on like the number of hot nights mm -hmm. where the low doesn't go below 90 or 85. And that's where it's really dangerous for vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's why I started off with the educational process uh, as a very important component of this. Uh, uh, so people understand both the definition as well as the science of it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great hearing about the research. So few, so few economically similar neighborhoods. Um, have very different outcomes in heat waves based on how much um, social infrastructure they have in terms of the active community groups, uh, you know, people in the habit of connecting with neighbors uh, did much better because the people take care of each other. Mm -hmm. and just figure out these details um, on the fly. Yeah. So I'll do that to focus on to creating those habits before they're the problem. Um, I just want to say the um, exposure is interesting because I just want to say that personally um, throughout the summer I actually don't really use too much AC going to sleep and the first couple nights are very difficult mm -hmm. it's very hot 
Um, but then afterwards it becomes a lot easier. Um, so I think that's a very interesting point. Yeah. I can also point out that the, um, the state came out with their climate resiliency plan. And there's some links, I have a link mm -hmm. to it in my doc and they have a resilient MA action team. Um, and that's a really good resource. And I know um, I just heard the governor speak about it at a conference. And was that the um, the climate um, like we can? I want to say Zara. I think it's called climate. Oh, right. Climate leaders mm -hmm. report that just came out, or is it something else? It might be. If you go, it's like mass.gov adapting to climate change with dashes. Yeah, I know it has a soil. So that can be a good resource because it gives data by region as well. Um, well, maybe let's let's um, yeah. switch gears so that we can end on time. But that yes. sounds like a great resource to kind of Mine and look at yeah. for next time. That's one question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Obviously, I miss this. It's very possible. But is there a, somebody working with a template which was focused about energy? We don't have energy per se, but it's really kind of falling within the buildings, I would mm -hmm. say. Oh, like solar and. and yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We don't, we, we don't have a separate energy like energy generation, but it's it's all within the stationary, which is the um, Okay, well we have just dug right in. This is so great. I can tell I'm excited about this, and um, so my hope is that we didn't get through every topic this time. So in our next meeting, hopefully we can pick up on the other topics. But um, you know. I think that the feedback that we got today and the additional ideas might help us refine what we're working on and continue to add ideas. And we don't have to have like a polished final template by the end of the year or something, but it would be good to sort of get to the point, I think, where we have clarified for ourselves, what do we know? What do we not know? We need to go out and talk to somebody else. What do we want feedback on from community members, experts, that kind of thing? So, you know, as you're as you're continuing to refine this, you might kind of think about that because the first part of next year in our work plan will be really focused on outreach. Like now that we've kind of done our initial homework, what do we need to learn? What input do we need? So we'll, we'll be turning our attention outward. Um, but with that in mind, um, I'd like to use the last 10 minutes of our meeting to get any feedback on the draft report um, to the select board, which I sent around. And just to refresh your memory, I can kind of tick off the main headers in here. So, and, and these headers, by the way, were what the select board asked of us. So they kind of laid out, here's what we want on a, you know, um, I guess it's a biannual, six, every six month basis. Um, so they wanted annual updated um, community-wide greenhouse gas inventory. So we, thanks to Apex and, and the work of, of Jack and Josh, we have that to report on. Um, then they wanted implementation steps accomplished within the past year. Obviously, we don't have implementation steps yet. This was kind of directed for the long term, but, um, but the draft progress report talks about uh, the things that we've done. Um, and then anticipated steps to be accomplished in the next two years. So again, they're um, talking about our, our work plan and, and what's to come. And then resources, including funding necessary to meet the charge of the Climate Action Planning Committee. And there's a little discussion there about funding. And then the rest is attachment. So the, the main progress report is less than two pages and then the rest is attached. So this was just a draft and I welcome any feedback or ideas you might have um, that you'd want to include in the progress report. When we discussed this offline, um, uh, my main concern was just noting that between this report and the next annual report or six months from now, we'll probably identify some action items that need to get rolling but sooner than our sort of final plan. Um, you know, I, I think we're planning on taking a better part of a year to get to a final plan. 
Um, in my mind, it's absolutely necessary to do the kind of engagement that's needed to make the plan relevant. Um, but that doesn't mean that nothing should be in in that time frame. It's just like there's some really obvious low hanging fruit um, or to present opportunities to take advantage of, or for example, um, yeah, state climate goals that need to be reached by 2025. We can't start with one in 2025. Mm -hmm. so, uh, just um, making it clear that uh, you may come to them with funding requests or, or action items that we like to their support on. Um, within that time frame. I think you did that, I did. It says, uh, going forward, the Climate Action Planning Committee may identify resources needed to support the committee's work, including resources needed before the Climate Action Plan is finalized. If so, we'll prepare a budget request and include it in a subsequent progress report. Yeah. Now, maybe that is too limiting if you feel like we might want to do yeah. it before then. But... No, I, I trusted that you added it. I, I think I just wanted to say that yeah. for the benefit of everyone here uh, to make sure that Folks are on the same page. And, um, um, I'm definitely not ready to, to promote any any action items tonight, but I think within the next few meetings, there may be some things I want to recommend, uh, or at least take take folks' uh, temperature on um, around you know staffing and like, grant applications. Yeah. And I read through it last week and well, yes, this looks great. And I'm looking at it again now and I, I can't think of you know something something else to add. Um I well this kind of popped into my head. This um you know so much of our suggestions are going to bump into other issues that are before committees and such that have gotten a lot of that are very controversial. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if this, you know, like what weight might this one forward give our report given mm -hmm. you know the other things? And I don't know if that's something they can speak to if we can ask that of them. I know they're kind of we're here to provide this to them, but I, I also wonder their feelings on this committee. Are you thinking that we might include that in the report or just maybe I, I'm not, you know, it just I think it would be hard for them to sort of pre-promise to support sure. a whole slate of action items that aren't written down yet. I think in, in my mind the the process of writing it and all the discussions and outreach we do um, that will actually set the plan in motion. Uh, and if we do that correctly, then by the time it's formalized, it'll just be sort of, you know, putting a bow on something that's right. already moving. And if we don't do it right um, and we haven't engaged stakeholders and actors and this sort of gotten people excited about some specific uh, things, then you know it doesn't matter whether they endorse it or not, like nothing's gonna happen. Yeah. Then anything that costs money is gonna have to go down. So so sorry. I do think the community outreach is super important. And if I just um you know in my neighborhood reflect on uh, a conversation that we had at our neighborhood association meeting regarding the bike master plan. So, you know, the town went through a, a robust initiative to create a bike master plan, but by the time it was um, written and, um, you know, it wasn't even presented to neighborhoods, my neighborhood association in particular was really concerned with it because it um, it identified that perhaps uh, um, Unquity Road would be expanded and about five feet of asphalt would be removed, or no, five feet of asphalt will be laid down and um, um, 
uh, to create ways for uh, more for bike lanes. And they also talked about making um, Unquity and Harlan Street a one way, um, which really caused concern to my neighborhood for public access uh, uh, for fire and police. So by the time in, in my neighborhood are big bikers and hikers. So we were not against the bike plan, but we were against a certain part of it. And it was just unfortunate that um, there was no outreach. Um, nobody consulted the neighborhoods that were impacted by the plan. And so, um, and, and by the time that our neighborhood was um, um, notified, it was already written and basically already endorsed by the selectmen. So um, it kind of was an unfortunate situation and you know when something is labeled as a master plan we kind of got nervous that any discussion that we've had um you know if the plan wasn't implemented for three or five years the discussions that were put in um and given um were, were probably going to be forgotten and um so public outreach is just hugely important and it takes a long time to get people to be involved. And um, it's it's a lot of work. And so before I think we present anything, we really need to get the residents um, um, input on it and um, have public forums um, in each neighborhood, just so it's easier for um, the neighborhood um, to get there um, last week. The planning department did a great job and they had a uh, forum on the, on an East Milton overlay proposal at the Milton Arts Center and all the neighbors from East Milton walked and it was great. Um, so I just think public outreach and resident input really, really goes a long way. I think it would be helpful to compile a list, a sort of best practices list of all the organizations and entities to try to get time with. Um, uh, we, we probably can sort of compile something from the experience of efforts like MBA, MBTA communities and and others. And also just knowing that um, even if you run a perfect outreach campaign and, and you have 10 times as much work as past ones, some people still won't hear about it until it's decided. And, and then that kind of triggers a new round of conversation where people who have been totally disengaged up until now hear, hear about it for the first time. So perfection is not possible, but I think we have to, we have to be excellent on, on this dimension. Mm -hmm. I really agree. I, I just want to say we're, so we're out of time. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, a major topic that is going to be the, the focus of our efforts for the beginning of next year. So I'm really glad that we're talking about it now because I think in our next meeting we can start to really think about how how do we are are we going to craft this engagement plan and and everything that the folks are saying is really important. It's going to be essential. It's like the most important part of our work. I think in a lot of ways is to have this engagement, you know, engage as many folks as possible in all different neighborhoods. So I really want to dig into that. But just to kind of close the loop on the the progress report. So I'll bring this back for our consideration next meeting for a vote, but last chance, any any changes folks want to make to the progress report? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so we'll vote on it next time. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to check that there's no public comments. There is no one else. Okay, great. Um, so then the last thing, I just want to confirm the date of our next meeting. Um, which is December 21st, third Thursday. That's getting pretty close to the holidays. I just want to make sure that we'll have a quorum to be able to meet. Is there anyone who won't be able to make that day? <laughs> Give folks a chance to check their calendars. Come on, yeah. Okay, good. And we'll make it festive. Bring some cookies and, you know, make it fun. I have a question though. Before yes. we launch into the outreach mm -hmm. effort, it would be important to have consensus on what we're outreaching. Yes. 
And so my question is, a lot of good reports have emerged from this, and what's the framework, the process for boiling this down? That is a great question. I think that that should be a central topic that we talk about next time. Yeah. Um, you know, as we look ahead in our progress report, so our plan for October through December was to um, do our research and um, start to develop a draft plan. And then for January through June, it's community and expert engagement. So I think if we can, in our next meeting, start to sort of figure out in more detail, what does that look like? How do we want to engage people? What, what do we want feedback on? How do we take our research and put it in a format that we can get feedback? Um, I think those would all be really productive things to talk about. So um, yeah, it just seems to me that there are a lot of suggestions that we've come up with. And um, somehow to have an effective outreach campaign, but we can't do all of them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And we're going to have to think about what do we do as a committee as a whole? And what do we break out and do as subgroups or individuals? Who do we talk to with what, um, you know, formats and engagement platforms? And there's, oh, there's so much to dive into. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, but yeah, let's, let's totally tackle the, start to tackle that okay. in our next meeting. And I think the more we, uh, focus on the individual and provide information and knowledge to individuals, uh, the better chance we have of people buying into what we're, what we're pushing mm -hmm. here. And uh, I think each of these really should have a, a portion that focuses directly on educating the individual. Yeah. That's going to be a huge component, I think, the education piece. Okay, we'll bring your ideas for next time. Um, and there's so much more to talk about, but um, I want to get people out of here on time. So we'll do that for today. Um, and then I think we have a start to an agenda for next time. I'll build to it, you know, build onto it, and, and share that around after talking with you out. So thank you again for all your work. And thanks for Ah uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, everybody in favor? Uh, okay, thanks. Appreciate uh, the <laughs> process. Uh, uh, yeah. Maggie, do you agree to adjourn? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.